it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I look forward also to visit you soon. Um, so thank you very much for the organizers for their excellent work for both for the school part and for the discussion part of this uh, sessions. And my contribution is about uh, somewhat a little bit out of scope of the atomic physics maybe, but uh, it's part of atomic and optical molecular physics uh, and in their quantum aspects. So let me share my screen. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to start with a little bit of disclaimer as usual that uh, thermodynamics, we assume it's a quite a conservative subject because we have a lot of everyday experience for it. And this understanding becomes uh, somewhat dogma in a sense. And the, on the opposite end of understanding, we have the quantum mechanics that we have no everyday experience directly. And it's about something invisible world. And then it's quite a weirdness that we try to understand after a lot of hard uh, work and studies. So when you talk about quantum optics of thermal devices, it is uh, natural that inevitably we have some clash of these two opposite ends of understanding regimes. So having said that, uh, let's see what quantum optics can say us about, uh, tell us about uh, this uh, general concepts, well understood so-called become dogmatic concepts of thermodynamics. So why we have this uh, so well assumed understanding of thermodynamics because it's part of our uh, even ancient life. So we started to develop our machines by harnessing the thermal energies many, many years ago. And uh, in all those uh, devices, uh, this is kind of art. There was no, in the old days, some systematic studies of them. But nevertheless, uh, during the first industrial revolution, people wanted to understand these different thermal machines more systematically. And that was the birth of science of heat engines or so-called thermodynamics. And there are three common laws of thermodynamics that you can associate with the different pro properties of these thermal machines. That uh, the first one is related to energy conservation, basically telling us that there is no free lunch, that you have to spend some energy to get some useful energy out of it. And the second one is about uh, more interesting. It tells us what is the efficiency bounds of these machines, how far we can go, and what is the cost and gain relations in this energy trade-off in the operation of these machines. And the third one is more technical. It's about uh, how uh, down to, we can get down to cool down an object in practice. Can we do it in a finite time? And interestingly, all these answers are negative and they have a feeling that we are quite limited in building our machines. And some people say that these are expressions of human frustration that uh, it's limiting our progress further. On the other hand, <clears throat> even though they played a significant role in the ancient times in the industrial revolutions, you may hope that by development of modern devices looking non-thermal like laser, and I think obviously thermal in laser or in computers as well, you can hope that by devising new ways of harnessing energy, by finding new sources of energy, we may get out of these limitations of thermodynamics and still progress further out of its bounds. On the other hand, surprisingly so far, it seems that even the modern progress is limited by thermodynamic bounds, which is uh, surprising because the first thing we teach in our courses to our students, every theory has it is well-defined bounds like Newtonian physics and so on. And then it has uh, out of its limitations, we can have new theories, but thermodynamics seems to be well, well reserved against the test of time. And even without its initial macroscopical bounds, it seems to work perfectly. <clears throat> so more deeper example related to quantum optics, one of the paradigmatic devices in optics or photonics is maser. And then uh, people realized in 1950s that you can map the operation of the laser to a heat engine and show that it is operationally limited by the Carnot efficiency. Okay, so this is an example how our modern machines can be limited by classical macroscopical laws. <clears throat> so why do we need then quantum thermodynamics? Because to escape the validations or limitations of classical world, usually the quantum mechanics allows us some vectors like the tunneling. Yes? So when we tell our students that the classical particles are limited to some zones 
which is which are classically allowed and cannot go beyond these classically forbidden zones, quantum mechanics allows you to escape through so-called tunneling effect. So can we find such an escape of these thermodynamical laws using quantum mechanical principles? This is more optimistic approach and people have big hopes that uh, quantum thermodynamics and machines developed by quantum thermodynamics can be more efficient, more powerful, more practical, and uh, allows us to progress further out of the thermodynamical bounds. <clears throat> so one kind of uh, impetus behind this work comes from the work of Marlon Scully, who first showed in, 19, in 2002 that uh, a classical auto engine can be improved beyond it is classical auto engine bounds, but still it is operating within the classical Carnot limit, but nevertheless, he, he, he was able to show that you can do something better by using lasers or masers in operation of a auto engine and design quantum optical auto engine no auto engine is a classical automobile like all engine and its operation can be improved, made more efficient. And we all know that our cars are not that efficient, but we can do more efficient in the quantum optical realm. But still we are, uh, we are not violating any of the thermodynamical laws. You can show that this auto engine, even after quantum improvement, still limited by the classical Carnot bound, which is a surprise. <coughs> So people then started after these initial promises of Marlon Scully's works. He had other ideas to improve quantum photovoltaics or other applications he proposed. So then people started to systematically investigate how far we can go and if we can even break the Carnot limit and so on. So systematic studies of thermodynamics of quantum systems now just classified under the term quantum thermodynamics, and we are discovering new limits. Of course, uh, we are also encountering new paradoxes. It's very active and lively field emerging rapidly. <clears throat> so let's go to basics. So first of all, why we say thermodynamics is uh, limited to classical systems, because to describe heat flows, to describe uh, work applications on systems, and to define even the temperature, you need a microscopic number of uh, particles, okay? But uh, our quantum systems, that one of the paradigmatic example that we teach our students is a particle in a box, then uh, it is highly different than uh, the systems that we use in our like a uh, ideal gas. Yes, they are very different than the examples that you can find in thermodynamics books. <coughs> So if we have such a particle in the box, can we even talk about, uh, we can maybe talk about work, but can we talk about heat or even more interesting, the temperature? Can we talk about temperature of a single atom, for example? So if you just uh, type temperature in Google and try to understand what it is, uh, you will encounter such uh, examples, even some applications that will show you there is a gas in a chamber and a thermometer is dipped into it, it will show a temperature, which is somewhat a measure of average kinetic energy of this uh, system, okay? So let's uh, try to make this uh, system more quantum mechanical, suitable, that's something we can study at the single atom level, then the uh, quantum optics can help. <coughs> so let's imagine simply a optical cavity a cavity quantum electrodynamical system, it's a paradigmatic model in quantum optics, that we have a single atom in a cavity and the, the cavity captures actually one atom in an ideal gas situation. Yes? So we can arrange that the, the gas is so dilute that one at a time only there is, we will find only one atom at a time inside the cavity, okay? So this scenario is also very common in quantum optics. We call this setting as a micromaser. Okay, so we take a cavity and we send the atoms through it like an atomic beam to pump the cavity field. And this is a very common a paradigmatic example. It served as a test bed to analyze very uh, many, many uh, hypotheses and theories of quantum optics as a toy model and also experimentally then studied by uh, a lot of uh, people. <clears throat> so here we want to ask the question if we can use the field state of the cavity uh, to understand a temperature 
a thermal property for this atom. <laughs> so if you're interested more on the micromaser theory, I can recommend you some very old paper from late 60s by Scully and Lamp. So they designed, they studied the master equation and they provided the general theory of uh, micromaser operation. So what is interesting in this general theory for us is that, uh, of course, in the old days, people were interested in amplification, maser action, and so on. So when they sent these atoms through the cavity, they were looking for a population inversion states in the pump beam so that uh, the cavity field can be amplified and maser action can be obtained. And the less interesting regime for them is the, if you send atoms in thermal states where the lower level population is more than the excited state population, so the atoms are thermal, then you get a cavity field in a thermal state, which is called black body regime, okay? So in this case, I am more interested in this regime, not in the maze direction, but I'm interested in the black body regime or thermalization of the cavity field by pumping it by thermal atoms, okay? <laughs> So interesting interpretation is given in this uh, 1967 paper of uh, Scully and Lamp. They said that, let's assume that we have a thermal atom. So excited state population is uh, less than the ground state population. And let's say that, <clears throat> let's imagine that we have uh, assigned a temperature to excited and ground states, okay? So ground state atoms, when they arrive to the cavity, with a certain probability that the ground state uh, atoms will arrive at the cavity, and the, this will be assigned to zero temperature. But uh, if the atom comes with some population, exact population, we can say this is assigned as a negative zero temperature. Negative zero temperature means it is the highest temperature you can imagine, okay? So therefore, through, by repeatedly pumping the cavity field with the, these uh, atoms, we can assume that population of the excited and ground states are like probabilities, okay? So there's a certain probability that we have found an atom in an excited state, and there's a certain probability that we will find an atom in the ground state. This is the usual description of quantum mechanics. So therefore, the whole scenario of macromaser operation in the thermal black weather regime can be mapped to a quantum open system. <clears throat> so the cavity field is our quantum system. It is open because it's connected to a minus zero Kelvin and zero Kelvin beds, thermal beds, okay? So in between these two extreme temperature regimes, depending on the how fast we are coupling the cavity field to these two beds, we can create any temperature. <clears throat> and the coupling rates of the cavity field to the negative and positive zero Kelvins are exactly the same with the populations of the excited and the ground levels, okay? So we just take a single atom and we just take the cavity and then we map it to a quantum open system problem. This is an amazing and beautiful way of thought and interpretation of thermalization of the cavity field by single atom pumping. Okay, so you can write down a master equation by taking the coupling rates of the two beds as population of the excited and population of the ground tables solve the master equation steady state, show that the cavity field is thermal and the temperature is just uh, determined by the population or coupling rates of the beds to the cavity field. Uh, let's skip this part <coughs> and understand that why do we expect the populations and the temperatures are related. There is a so-called detailed balance principle in quantum open systems. So basically the rates of transitions between the ground and excited states, there's a balance between them. The ratio is given by the Maxwell-Boltzmann factor of this exponential minus n gap divided by temperature and so on. So this is given by the ratio of these transition rates. But when we make it map to the open system with negative and positive zero temperatures with the coupling rates determined by the population rates, Again, you recover this detailed balance picture exactly, okay? <clears throat> so without going into details of the master equation, I can tell you that this is directly coming from the detailed balance that you can also see it from the master equation. 
<laughs> but so far then everything looks like quite stochastic open system dynamics, nothing profoundly quantum mechanical in this picture. So we send the atoms in thermal states, then the cavity field thermalized, master equation describe the rate and fight the temperature depending on the population of the energy levels. Nothing is so quantum here except that we have the energy levels, right? So it's somewhat belong to the first quantum of quantum mechanical revolution, nothing to do with the second quantum revolution or quantum technologies. <clears throat> Can we find more profound effects, more modern quantum mechanical effects here? <clears throat> so the idea is the following, that uh, if we map the thermalization of our black body regime of the micro maser, so an open system dynamics between negative and positive zero temperature beds, can we manipulate the transition rates thanks to our experience from quantum optics? Yes, and we know a lot of things that we can do to manipulate the transitions as we have electromagnetic in this transparency, we have laser without inversion, we have uh, optical trapping states and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> so the idea is can we do this here and somewhat uh, quantum mechanically engineer using superposition states through the thermal state of the cavity. So from our picture, that quantum superposition or coherence effects field allows us to change the transition rates, okay? And the, if you want to look at it and compare it for more classical picture, where transition rates of cold and hot atoms, that is negative zero and positive zero temperature atoms in the excited and ground state, these transition rates are equivalent to heating and cooling processes, yes? And the, there is a historical being that can manipulate transfer rates of the hot and cold atoms to a system. This is known as Maxwell Demon. You can learn it about even from iPad or your, from your cell phones. Just to go to application store and just to download any game called Maxwell Demon and you will learn about it. It's so common, well-known thing. <clears throat> so the idea is Let's say this minus zero temperature atoms in the excited states are red and zero temperature atoms populating the ground state are blue. So basically we want to change their order of transfer to the cavity, yeah? And this can be done by Maxwell Demon. <clears throat> and Maxwell Demon in our case will be the quantum coherence that will manipulate the transition rates in the atom. So this is the basic idea, but you can understand that uh, this uh, is no, no longer classical Maxwell Demon. We want to use quantum coherence in an atom to manipulate the transition rates. Okay. <clears throat> and then if you do this, actually you are breaking the detailed balance. Yes. So no longer you want this transition between upper and the lower levels are balanced with the Maxwell Boltzmann factor. We want to break this, and it is uh, we want to utilize this quantum mechanical effects to do something that we cannot do with the classical thermodynamics. Okay. <clears throat> so what type of coherences we can use? So we have two level atom, and uh, let's say we have excited and ground state in quantum superposition. This is very similar to like a live, live, that, live and that uh, cat example of Schrodinger that uh, we can talk about quantum superposition states. But uh, if you just uh, solve the master equation and find the state of the cavity in the long time limit, you will see that it is no longer thermal. So if you have not only a thermal atom, but some superposition of these two states, so your density matrix is no longer thermal, no longer canonical Gibbs form, but has some coherences, then you can easily show like a homework example that you can show that steady state is not thermal. So you are not in the black weather regime of micro -maser. So this cannot work as a thermometer. You cannot talk about temperature of a Schrodinger cat state in this sense. <clears throat> okay. But some people, clever people, found a way that you can have a thermal state of the cavity, but still also have some coherences in the atom. Okay. <clears throat> So again, Scully and other important people in quantum optics, uh, pioneers of quantum optics like Agarwal, Walter, and Subari, they come together and uh, designed an atomic state that can thermalize the cavity and keep it in black body regime. 
and still enjoy quantum coherence. <clears throat> And this is the state. Okay, so we have the usual excited on the ground state populations and also some quantum coherence between within the atom. But for that aim, instead of the two level atom, they said that, okay, let's now take split the ground state a little bit. Okay, so let's say the ground state is like a doublet of two levels, closely related, closely separated, closely energetically not too far away from each other. So we can still, couple a single mode cavity to the transitions, okay? <clears throat> and they have found that such a state will not disturb the thermal state of the cavity. We will, we will stay, stay in the black weather regime. And it is temperature surprisingly can be much higher relative to the test of using thermal atoms, okay? And this is a surprise. So suppose you have atom prepared in a hot oven at a certain temperature, so this PE and PG populations are thermally distributed. And then somehow you inject coherence between the lower levels, okay? <laughs> this epsilon characterized the coherence injected after the atom is coming out of the oven. So in this case, if you send it into the cavity, the cavity will not equilibrate with the oven temperature, but it will get a higher temperature, okay? So the next question these uh, people asked, uh, Scully and co-workers, uh, Agarwal, Walter, and Subari, they asked, if I have a temperature gradient in my system between the oven and the cavity, thanks to coherence, can I convert this difference, this temperature gradient into some useful work? And they designed a machine, a device called a photocarno engine <coughs> to convert this temperature difference Inject, due to injected coherence into work. And this is called this Photocarno engine. And this is published in Science in 2003 and it attracts a lot of attention and also a lot of discussions whether this is operating in the Carnot limit or not. Because uh, if you calculate the efficiency of this device, let's see what happens, okay? So let's take this R3 level atom without any coherence and just it comes directly from the oven, no coherence injected. It goes through the cavity and we calculate the efficiency of the engine and it's exactly the same with the Carnot efficiency, okay? Then we put coherence to the lower doublet and run the atom again through the cavity, calculate the efficiency and we found the surprise. <clears throat> so this phi here characterize a phase in the coherence between the lower level doublet. And if you choose the phase properly, you can see that you can get something more than the classical carbon efficiency, okay? Of course, the, as I said, there is a clash at the beginning of my talk between the two opposite ends of understanding. One is conservative dogmatic view of thermodynamics and the other one is weirdness of the quantum mechanics. And then when they clash, people discuss uh, uh, hardly, yeah? And then uh, <clears throat> it is again nowadays understood that this actually does not violate the second law, but we have to generalize the classical second law to a more quantum mechanical or more general perspective. <clears throat> and another weirdness here is that if the oven temperature and let's say the hot temperature is the same with the environment temperature, cold temperature, of course, the efficiency of the Carnot will be zero. You can, there is no temperature gradient. But thanks to the coherence here, we have a temperature gradient and we have non-zero efficiency. This is again, looks like a violation of the second law and the, <clears throat> why we don't want to violate it. Because if you can violate it, some other creative people can come up with so-called uh, perpetual motion machines. But uh, this is uh, hardly accepted, yes? So this is uh, even against the first law. <clears throat> So people suggested that we can define a new temperature for the atom effectively. So embed this coherence into an effective temperature and treat the atomic beam or atom as a bath, not in the minus zero Kelvin or zero Kelvin, but at some temperature that depends on the coherence of the atom as well. So we can assign effective temperature to coherent atoms if they can thermalize quantum thermometers. This was the idea to resolve the 
and recover the efficiency within the Carnot limit again. <clears throat> so this is somewhat generalized second law in the quantum regime when there are coherences by assigning some temperatures to quantum states. <clears throat> but so far, experimentally, this has not been realized. And in 2006, people showed that uh, current KVT state of the art, quality factors are not high enough to show the efficiency and the work improvements in photonic Carnot systems. So they studied circuit QED, they studied optical cavities, different uh, parameters, and they found that always it is so difficult to do. <clears throat> we suggested that we can scale up the coherence in the system by using not a single three-level atom, but multi-level atoms, for example, or we can use many atoms and get into spiridian macromaze regime to limit to get uh, out of the limitations of the dephasing and the coherence effects. And then even within the current state of time, we propose that it may be possible to get the uh, scaling high enough to, to, to see some quantum effects and effects of coherence in the system. <clears throat> so that was our idea to use uh, scalable coherences. Still the phasing and the coherence will limit the progress. So if you use more and more levels, or more atoms to, 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 to do something, even, even if there's the coherence, then you get some increase in the coherence increase in the work or efficiency. But then after a certain number of atoms or levels, you expose your system to the environment more and you lose the benefits of scaling. So we call it as the quantum law of diminishing returns. So there's a critical number like in the order of 10, so you need about 10 qubits or 10 level system to, to beat the current in state of the art cavities to see these effects predicted by Scully and co-workers. <clears throat> okay, so basically then uh, the scaling and how it works, basically the cavity erase the information content in the atomic beams and convert it to heat, but not every initial coherences can be converted to heat. So this is not a general situation, but if, if certain states like decay states or other uh, W state, et cetera, they can be converted to heat and can be used for this purpose. <coughs> so the question is, can we find the general class of states which can be converted to heat? And if they cannot be converted to heat, can we say these states can be used to harness directly as the work energy. <clears throat> so we approach this problem as an information machine instead of a heating machine. So this is uh, like an analog quantum computer, which is uh, injected states are not uh, perfectly information states, but also like thermal coherent states. So they can have also temperature content. So this is a generalized picture of the quantum computer where it can also accept thermal states and process them to produce either work like a coherent output or it can produce incoherent output in the case of thermalization. Okay, so it's a little bit generalized picture of the Turing machine, not only information processing, but also incoherent energy processing device. So in this picture, we define the work heat operationally and classified some quantum states like, uh, as we said, the superposition state is non-thermal, so this can be classified as a work type of state or resource. <clears throat> but if you go to bare states, you find that they can be converted to heat entirely, and then you can classify them as heat or uh, states, and you can assign temperature to bare states. <clears throat> and the generalization of the bare states to W states will be also heat-like, and the GHC states will be like uh, work-like. This, this trend continues like that. Then we found a general group theoretical structures of these states. And uh, basically, without going into much details, if you are close to main diagonal of the density matrix in the energy basis, then these are the states. If they contain these coherences, these are the states that will have uh, that will have uh, some effective temperatures and will have will produce some heat flows. <clears throat> so then we propose the minimal quantum field to operate 
that this is a thermal or information devices. <clears throat> and this is the typical structure of the energy basis density matrix. And the point is that all the functional classification of the states are disjoint. So if one state belongs to heat-like, it cannot be belong to work-like, like a WGHC separation. We have here functional separation of thermodynamical separation of the quantum states as well. <clears throat> so there is a, this group theoretical structure that you, you can see. Okay, so I will not go into details of this, but uh, are there are other quantum optical applications like uh, more uh, spin tronic applications and quantum optical applications. So some experiments as well, like uh, this is the EIT heat engine experiment published in 2017. And uh, there are also circuit QED experiments that uh, you can have thermal diodes, quantum optical thermal diodes and transistors and uh, some other ideas about uh, photocell enhancement with quantum thermodynamical and optical ideas. Again, coherence helps. <clears throat> of course, in biology and nature, we don't know if coherence really helps, but these are artificial biomimetic inspired studies. So we don't care if there is coherence in biological system or not, but suppose there is, and then we can design some thermal transport devices that can harness and utilize coherences in our artificial synthetic devices. Some people also say that uh, this can also, in a sense, justifies there may be coherent effects in biological systems, but this is more controversial discussion. <laughs> okay, so to conclude that uh, we have quantum optical route to quantum thermometry or quantum thermodynamics. So basically in these applications, uh, optical cavities are acting like thermometers to classify quantum states and harness their work or heat uh, content as a resource. They treat them as a resource. And using this idea, many different devices from heat engines to transistors are uh, proposed. Thank you so much. Hello. Can I ask the question, Bulinuda? Professor Oz Ozer. Yes, is I cannot hear Bimal, but yeah, I can yeah, hear yeah. you. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, the, is there any experiment which is support that efficiency can be beyond the classical limit? There is an experiment uh, using NV centers. And here, instead of the efficiency, there is some increase in the power dissipation. So in the major type of heat engine, you can, if you inject coherence in the working fluid in the NV center, the power can be more. But the problem is that uh, in this case, you can also say that efficiency is increased because uh, power is increased relative to the environmental thermal cost. But uh, there's also the cost of generating and injecting coherence into the system. So then if you calculate the actual operational efficiency to induce coherence into the system, to beat the cardinal limits and so on, then this becomes a controversial question. And in many cases, this cost can be high and the, the benefits of adding coherence can be less. So people are also discussing spontaneously generated coherences or some coherences injected with less costly manners. So there are open, open research directions there how to inject coherence in the most economical way and still get something better than the classical bars. Okay, thank you. But another question is that uh, how the coherence lifetime going to affect the de definition of the efficiency of the Carnot or the auto engine? Yeah, so the coherence lifetime is important for the atoms if they deface then uh, this will reduce the efficiency. So there is a catch here. That is uh, when I talk about quantum law of diminishing returns. So if you add more and more coherence, make the system more coherent to make it uh, larger, you expose it, uh, you make it more fragile in a sense. So there is a trade-off optimization 
regarding the structure of the atom in which levels you want to put coins, etc. So in general, after a certain uh, range, like in the quantum computers, when you have a large quantum computer, it's more difficult to maintain entanglement. So there is a certain critical size that you need to optimize beyond which you lose the advantage of coherence because of the dephasing. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your nice explanation. So I'd say uh, Professor Dr. Gupta has a question. So Professor Dr. Gupta, please unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Yeah, I unmuted. The question is, some yeah. time back, there are a lot of work on this enhanced heat transfer. They used to calculate by this Green's function, two-point Green's function and other things. And they're reporting that in certain cases, you can really enhance this heat transfer. Those classes are problem. Do they have any bearing on the, in the context of this quantum thermodynamics, where you can enhance the heat transfer and uh, try to enhance the efficiency of this Carnot cycle or this uh, auto cycle or anything? Yeah, the broader picture that can be come from the thermodynamics. So the usual approach to transport problems is of course the green functions. But you can also use the open system master equation methods to investigate these problems. So people are even discussing this uh, topological systems for the transport with the edge currents and the bulk currents and so on. And then they use the language of thermodynamics and quantum thermodynamics to talk about the efficiency of transport. And they found that between the reservoirs, because the, so far I just uh, in this talk talk about the reservoirs that can be classified by temperature. But there are generalized also relations. So not only temperatures, but chemical potential information content of the reservoirs, all of them can be included. And you can write a general Onsegar type current coming from the information current, entropic heat current plus the particle current. Yes. And you have generalized Onsegar relations that can be also studied using the green functions or open system theories. It is just a methodology. But there's a general, more broader picture of transport theory in the quantum thermodynamics as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question from the audience? Uh, I have a question. Uh, like, okay. like now we are defining temperature uh, in terms of coherence, right? Like as opposed to the uh, traditional definition of temperature. So my question is like that, can we associate uh, uh, specific temperature values to elementary particles, just like we define uh, a specific value to the mass charge spin like that. So can we have- yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a very nice question. So actually the question even goes to this epistemologic and ontologic views of the density matrix or quantum state, right? So how to define the state and associate the temperature to it. Can we do it at the single particle elementary particle level? So I am more favor in, in the favor of uh, uh, this uh, idea that we can do it provided that uh, normally when you look at the density matrix, yes, so it has the classical and quantum contents. We multiply quantum states, projection operators with some uh, classical probabilities. So this is where the classicality enters into system. And we assume that once you make a measurement, you lose the state, yes? So it projects into certain, uh, collapse into certain state. So therefore you need an ensemble concept to talk about the temperature and thermodynamics. But uh, you know, there are also weak measurements and the uh, non-disturbative measurements of the quantum state. So in this picture, this is kind of philosophical discussion. If I can access the density matrix only once, then I need an ensemble, or can I just use the single particle state without ensemble concept to define the temperature, entropy, and so on. It's kind of philosophical discussion, and I am in favor of that I can do this, and I can assign a temperature to a single particle. And if the single particle has different uh, degrees of freedom, colors, uh, spins, et cetera, coherence, then this can be operationally added into temperature, provided that you define the temperature in an operational way. That is, you measure the temperature using a thermometer, and thermometer should stay in a thermal state. So you have to preserve the Gibbs. Yeah? So the interaction between the elementary particle and the thermometer should preserve the Gibbs. Yeah, it should be a Gibbsian map preserving interaction. 
then if you can do this, then you can assign the temperature of the thermometer, but you see it, it will depend on the color degrees, spin degrees of the elementary particle, then you can say that this is the temperature effectively assigned to the elementary particle. So if uh, there is no more question, uh, let us thank uh, the speaker, Professor Ajgar Mostika Pliglu, for this excellent talk and very stimulating talk, I would say. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be with you always.